Hello and welcome to the German Guy Reviews. I am the German Guy. I kind of like The Witcher. That is, I like the Netflix adaptation. The first two games are okay and I still haven't come around to play the third one. Once I get around to build up enough courage to break one of my own legs so I have enough time to appreciate the whole thing. Geralt of Rivia is unlike any other fantasy protagonist, in that he is morally ambivalent. And not the kind that you sometimes see in modern adult shows, the kind who kills a room full of innocent people and they all but turn to the camera and go, aren't we all pieces of shit? No, no we are not. I haven't killed a room full of people. Yet. No, he does have a moral center beneath the hard shell, but he questions, and he isn't a knight in shining armor, perfect and clean. He curses, gets drunk and into fights, and he is the guy in the corner with a leather jacket that shows up only first and last day of school. And in between that time period, he gets all the girls pregnant, teachers included. The Witcher was originally written in the 90s by Andrzej Zapskowski. I deeply apologize for butchering that name, but on the other hand, it's better than being born a generation earlier and butchering the entire person. Hey -o! Being a character that is mostly known for the games or the streaming show, people forget his origins from the Polish lands, and as it was only natural in the land of his birth, People gave him attention there long before they did anywhere else. So, my dear neighbors to the east gave him a movie adaptation in the year 2000. So, let's watch it and viciously judge them for it. The movie opens up with the Polish title of the movie, Visidine. Hmm, first time I have to put three different titles in my video. A dude on a white horse visits a farmer, saying he has come to claim what he owes him, as per the customs of the world, which anyone who watched the show knows is something the person in question doesn't know yet about. You know, that kind of oath seems a bit flawed in design. Say for instance you have someone who is extremely organized and never has any surprises. You may wait 20 years before a free coupon arrives in the other guy's mail and it's like, oh I didn't expect that. I will take that, thank you. For the farmer, that which he did not know about he would possess one day is his 7 year old son. And right away the first major problem stares into our collective faces. The voice acting is really bad. I don't know if the voice actors were just unmotivated, but they sound bored to their teeth. Then there's the lip sync, which I admit is nobody's fault, since there is simply no way to make our two languages compatible mouth movement wise. But it really feels as if I am watching an old samurai movie from the 60s. Just with a lot more cover. The boy, named Geralt, who else would it be, is taken to his new home where they waterboard him. Tell us where the terrorists are hiding! You know, with how bad Americans are at geography, it wouldn't surprise me if this was actually declassified intel. No, of course, this was a ritual to turn young Geralt into a witcher. And I know that because I know a little bit about the source material. To anyone else coming in the first time, it just looks like they are just a bunch of sadistic dicks. The boy is told his purpose. He will roam the lands and fight the monsters that threaten humanity. And they make it sound as if the witchers were some kind of noble hero order here, 
but all they only want is to earn enough coin to get by and everything else is of no concern to them. Of course, I have to emphasize once again, I only know this little about the Witcher franchise, but if both the Netflix show and the games portray them like that, I'm very certain that I'm on the correct side of history on this. Then the young man, who looks like a very old man, is sent out into the world. But before I do that, I'm going to finish my coffee, read the newspaper and go golfing. Old people stuff. Yet another witcher kills a few humans, which is a big no-no among witchers, so they banish him. The witcher, the bad one, tells him he will have his revenge, but Geralt only replies he will be waiting for him. Later in time, Geralt then is given his full witcher seal of approval. Swords, accessories, armor, everything. That's cool, I have the exact same necklace. I wonder if they put these in the McDonald's kids menu when this thing came out. Or I might actually have bought the original one from the film set by accident. Anyway, we see a young princess named Pavetta and her mother enjoying the afternoon in the woods. When suddenly a monster worm shows up. Our anti-hero hero jumps to the rescue and after a bit of killing the air he also hits the monster. I should point out the movie roughly tells the plot of the first season of the Witcher series, meaning that the kingdom of Nilfgaard, once very small and insignificant, has become a huge threat to their realm, so Princess Pavetta needs to marry in order to sustain peace. While in the series that wasn't even on the agenda, and in fact Her Majesty mocked Nilfgaard for its weakness at gatherings. And I have to admit, I like the characterization of the queen from Netflix much better. True, this queen is what a ruler should be, wise and considerate, but the other one was just so much more fun to look at. First, we conquer the east, then the west, then we split the kingdom in half and attack each other. Geralt is sent out to kill someone who Pavetta is in love with, called the Hedgehog because he could ruin the queen's attempt to forge an alliance. Geralt meets up with him and it's Duke de Poos. No need to panic, Ratty. No need to panic. Stay calm! Stay calm! The Witcher does not kill the Hedgehog as he is a human, but he tells him to stay away from Pavetta. He, on the other hand, replies that thanks to the law of surprise, the one about giving up something you don't know you will yet have, that Pavetta is promised to become his wife. He furthermore explains that once he has done this, the curse that is upon him that forces him to turn into the animal that he is named after will be lifted. Then we just do it like Dragon Ball did and blow up the moon. Problem solved. Did they ever bring that up again? I mean, you should believe that blowing up the moon would have some devastating consequences on the environment. Then again, there were already human-animal hybrids running around, so there was not anything healthy going on there. Anyway, Geralt rides back and, hey, isn't that the castle from Mystic Knights? Does anybody else remember that show? It was like Power Rangers, but set in the Middle Ages. It had an intro song by the Kelly family. It was weird. The Witcher delivers the news and the Queen has no choice but to move on with the banquet. But Lord Hedgehog shows up and crashes the party. The soldiers take his helmet and reveal... The mutant abomination from the first draft of the Sonic movie. Honestly though, it looks actually somewhat okay, compared with the previous creatures. I had suspected they would just take a bunch of grinded up meat and put a bunch of toothpicks in it. This is one of our national dishes. You should have just killed us all when you had a chance. Anyhow, a fight breaks out over the princess's hand, during which Pavetta's magic powers, mentioned earlier, Activate and she screams the entire party to pieces. But I really wish she didn't do that with her hands. 
It makes the whole thing look so derpy. The queen, who looks like she just finished 10 days of uninterrupted banging, gives up and lets the man have her daughter. May the angels have mercy upon you the day she dips her toe. Pavetta and her new husband then want to reward Geralt. Why? All he did was not kill them. If not killing someone is cause for a reward, then I would... eventually get something. Probably. Most likely. Maybe. So they do the Oath of Surprise thing. And we cut to many years later. Which, as much as it pains me to say it, I have to give the movie credit for. In the show adaptation, I only realized halfway through that it was cutting back and forth in time. And yes, part of why I didn't notice is because I am a dummy and me brain does think no good. But in the show it was a bit too seemingly, with no indication that it was happening. Anyhow, Geralt brings back a robber lizard. And that is impressive to a guy named Borch. So he asks our silver-haired slayer man if he would like to kill an even bigger lizard. A dragon. Geralt and Borch have a conversation in a tavern where the Witcher explains that he doesn't kill dragons, because the only reason why they attack humans and their cattle is because humans have taken all the land, cut down all the forests and there is simply no place left for them to go. So naturally, being an environmentalist, he goes with Borch and his two Amazon friends five minutes later. <laughs> I just read this as two Amazon friends, as in Amazon employees. What is this? Friends you order from Amazon? I think if you put me in an isolation cell for 10 years, my mind is going to keep me quite occupied. To disturb the peace of a dragon, also they meet the famous bard, who isn't as nearly as sassy as in other media. Also, all the horniness is missing completely. Damn it, the horny police was way too effective. Geralt is not a hypocrite for wanting to go after the dragon, however. There is a reason, and that reason is his past love, Jennifer, who desperately wants to have children but can't, but believes she will be able to once she made a potion out of the dragon's tissue. An avalanche then destroys the camp. That's what you get for using Mako energy. So the troop finds the dragon, who looks as disappointing as you can expect. The amazing strategy of the knights of riding towards the dragon and then back doing nothing fails for some reason, so they go after a dragon youngling. If you give me glue and chewed gummy bears, I am making you a better dragon than that. Also this wonderful fire effect. After defending the little Spyro dude, Geralt goes to pick up his promised reward from ages ago, which is the child of Pavetta. Does anybody in this world ever take anything else except children, or is the price for them on the black market that high? By the way, all these scenes with the dragon and Jennifer and all that will play no significant role in the second half of the movie. So thanks for wasting your time, I guess. Queen Calante begs the Witcher not to take the child, as she is the only one who can take her throne and defend the kingdom against Nilfgaard, her parents being long dead too, but Geralt doesn't want to hear it. The problem is, the girl isn't anywhere near the castle, because her grandmother wanted to protect her, so Geralt gets on his horse and starts searching. Yeah, this is usually the quest where I just use the marker on the map, even though it is absolutely nonsensical that a character would know by sheer instinct where he needs to go. Shortly later, the Nilf Guardians attack the kingdom with bad special effects. Come on, couldn't you have at least made one bonfire inside of one of the rooms to make smoke come out of it? Now evil soldiers are in charge, with their new city supervisor, Ron Jeremy. Toss a coin to your stripper, you bonus of plenty. The Kaiser of Nilfgaard told his minions that the girl Geralt is looking for needs to be found, because her being found by any of the lords or dukes of the old kingdom could result in civil war. Oh no, that's the thing that the beanie boy is warning about for over 50 years. A civil war that the elves and dwarves could be take part in to liberate their lands. Yes, elves and dwarves. You know, these beings that are kind of important to the Witcher lore. And 
that you see only like once in this film with no impact on the story whatsoever. Suffice it to say that racism is also never brought up. This time, however, the white wolf is badly hurt and manages to get himself to some kind of all-woman monastery, where, coincidence of coincidences, Siri, the girl he was looking for, is living. Fantasy authors have it really easy. They can legitimately reply to accusations of, oh, it's happening because the plot demands it, with, oh no, it's the mystical forces of destiny. We also learn that the leader of the Nilfgaard soldiers is the same witcher that wanted to take revenge on Geralt for being a snitch when he was a child. Snitches get silver sword stitches. Try to say that three times in a row. Our hero tells him that the sanctuary is under his protection so he better doesn't come near it. Naturally, the villain couldn't give less of a fuck and comes back the very next day when he is informed that Ciri is supposedly hiding in the monastery. When the former witcher threatens to kill innocent people, Ciri reveals herself. The dead can talk, so the evil leader orders all the women to be killed. I didn't even know that it was possible to sound both as if you are trying too hard and not trying at all. Geralt hears in a tavern that a holy place in the direction he came from was attacked and instead of heading back right away to check up on them, he goes what we all would do in that situation. He goes to a fortune teller to tell him what happened. Okay, don't know why the doctor needs a second opinion on this, but whatever. Anyway, the next couple days our beloved friend of humanity spends his days defending the city and his fortune teller friend from some goons with his predator powers. The white wolf of Rivia finds the camouflage nuns who tell him that they have no idea where Siri could be. Using his cleverness, Geralt tricks some of the soldiers to tell them what he needs to know. In another city, Geralt fights the soldiers and I have to admit this fight is choreographed really well. Nothing groundbreaking, of course, but it fits the format and it's something decent for a change. Too bad it gets interrupted by Siri running around wearing this. There's no explanation giving why, she simply does. From all the questions that I have, and there are many, the most important one right now. How did the conversation in the sex shop go? Um, yeah, hi there, um, I need a gimp mask for an eight-year-old, please. Jesus Christ, man, and the Slavic people already have a reputation for making fucked up movies. Uh, better get away from this before the police rings at me door. Geraldo challenges the leader guy to a duel, who refuses, but then attacks him from behind like the coward he is. But of course, our hero's senses are even sharper than the sword he carries. He then finds Siri sometime later, and that is where season 1 would end, and where we also would need a sequel, since Nilfgaard is still in power, Jennifer still can't have children, and the other girlfriend we haven't even met. This was not a fine experience. There is endless talking with tons of names about people and places being dropped, which might be cool for diehard fans of the series, but to me it all sounds like uninteresting gibberish. And it makes me feel as if everything and nothing is happening at the same time. Is that how people feel like when they first get introduced to Kingdom Hearts? It drags on and on and oh dear lord how slow everything moves. I saw this with a friend not so long ago and I realized that I completely forgot like an entire hour about this two hour long movie when I watched it again. It runs into the same problem story wise as the World of Warcraft movie. You have such a huge lore which you try to condense into movie length and that never works. The show, which is one hour long episodes each, is absolutely necessary to tell the story the way it needs to be told. Stuff like Gerard's relationship with Jennifer is never brought up again, and it had absolutely no impact on anything whatsoever. 
I wish I could say the puppetry was better than the special effects, but that would be a lie. When monsters show up, what they do is to zoom in way too close so that I don't even properly see what I'm supposed to be embarrassed by. The actor, who plays Gerald, looks close enough and I'm sure if I understood Polish, he would talk the part okay. The end fight with some of the soldiers showed me that they had some good ideas, but it seems they had to rush it for some reason, which is why all the action is so awful. It's one long boar fest and I would feel angry at my own countrymen for having such a great internationally recognized character only to be screwed up so badly and have others do it infinitely better. I can only describe this film in one word. Mm.